Hi, I'm Brad, and this thing I'm holding is completely unrelated to this video. So last week, right before a hurricane struck my area, I released a series of cat images and explanations for what may be the Quest 3, or at least a current version of what is known as Project Stinson within the meta offices being worked on right now. And I basically rushed to get that video out as soon as possible, and I'm very happy with the video and all the information in it, but after spending about a week with, uh, well, mostly a few days without power and thinking and seeing all the reactions to it and all the opinions, I kind of wanted to spend even more time going over it and sort of do a follow up and clarification video, which is the one you're watching right now. Again, if you enjoy this content or any content I make related to this stuff, uh, yeah, please subscribe, like and leave a comment like all these people did for my last video. A lot of these people had kind of the same ideas and same uh, complaints or uh, speculations, and I want to kind of address all the main ones in this video. So again, the first video was kind of a rush together to get the leak out there before my power went out. Um, and this is a clarifications and strategy opinions video because I think what Meta is working on with this Stinson, uh, if it does actually release in the state I showed it in, it actually made a lot of sense to me. Um, I think it made more sense to me kind of following this industry and, and like all the things going on within it. And some people who have only uh, maybe are newer to the VR scene or have only seen VR as a gaming only device. Unrelated to all of this, though, I did have some people that are complaining about my new method of uh, kind of putting my logos all over the slides that I'm putting on. So don't worry for the people that did not like that. I have decided to fix it just for you. Much better. Yeah, that, that was that was a joke. Uh, anyway, let's just get right into it. Uh, Quest 3 Project Stinson. I want to go into first about the tracking, uh, the 60 OF. I made one slight mistake that is not actually a big mistake. It's more just a code name that I kind of jumbled together. Um, so I said that there were two Canyon cameras on the sides for 60 OF tracking, and that is true. Um, but I didn't go in to mention that there are two Glacier cameras in the front. Those are the two black and white cameras I talked about in my first video. And uh, I think a lot of people got confused because I didn't say those front cameras would be used for 60 OF tracking as well. And yes, every black and white camera that is used in a Quest product right now that is dedicated to the actual 60 OF and positional tracking systems related to, I mean, even controllers, if the matter of uh, fact comes down to it. Now, of course, the actual Glacier cameras, which are the front ones, uh, are also there for mixed reality. Again, the idea is they will overlay the color pass through on top of those uh, actual positional cameras for a more uh, fast, high refresh rate because black and white cameras run at a higher refresh rate and they don't have to run at a higher uh, resolution. And that's why they kind of overlay the higher resolution color, uh, slower refresh rate cameras on top of it because if you want really fast, high quality tracking, you need those higher refresh rates, which is why they do all of this. And again, just more view of uh, all the cameras that would be doing uh, 6 UF or standard black and white IR tracking. Again, one uh, on the left side, one on the right side, and two pointing outward in the middle. There's also one more thing I didn't really touch on my video, and I, I, I saw a couple of people actually realize this. Um, in my recent or semi-recent videos talking about the Quest Pro, I talked about how the depth projector and depth sensor, uh, I've been told many times that it would be used to do even more higher fidelity hand and finger tracking without actual controllers. Um, some of you may be aware that there is a uh, hand tracking 2.0 on the Quest 2, and all that's just pure camera vision. Uh, it works pretty well. And uh, with the Quest Pro, at least first, I've been told many times that a depth projector, which is sending off many little lights, a, kind of like a dot projector all over your fingers, and that depth sensor and the IR cameras will be able to see those dots and uh, get even more higher fidelity hand tracking. So by having a depth sensor and depth projector, they would be able to also do this on the Stinson or Quest 3 if they did indeed include this depth uh, projection and sensor. Now, I think the biggest confusion more than anything uh, was the fact that this is clearly a mixed reality focused device. And up until now, and, and, and of course, a week from now, there will be the Meta Connect, which they'll be showing off the Quest Pro and, it, and some of its software and the features. They'll probably be showing off some of those mixed reality uh, capabilities. But up until now, mixed reality has been like a very minute thing where no companies would show off really the insane things. Uh, the best example I like to give of what mixed reality might be able to do is the obvious example of something like Pokemon Go for gamers. 
if you could actually uh, travel or, or even do stuff in your house at first and maybe go outdoor during certain lighting conditions because uh, the sun at max uh, max brightness will still kind of bleed out your actual black and white tracking and cameras. I think there is a lot of value there. And that's just on the gaming side. There's also the other uh, use cases of like being able to place large uh, Netflix screens or anything around your house that don't require buying a, an expensive TV. Um, by having more comfortable and like thinner lenses, thinner fronts, you can do more use case scenarios than just gaming. And I think mixed reality will actually uh, make adoption of these devices better. So basically, I believe while the MetaQuest 2 was a, a really good uh, adoption booster for VR headsets, like they sold more than 10 million, apparently, of those headsets because they made it so cheap. And not only did they uh, make a lot of users and new consumers be able to afford VR, but they got a lot of developers uh, to buy these basically $300 developer kits to make their own software, which would kind of boost the ecosystem in a uh, never ending cycle. And I believe that Meta wants to do this with mixed reality. Again, the actual software potential is not shown yet. I think they're going to spend a lot more time in the next year showing off some of these things, especially Apple. Apple has been talking so much about uh, how they believe AR and mixed reality is going to have a ton more value for consumers than VR. But again, AR, those optical glasses AR that we always see in like kind of sci-fi and renders, uh, the technology for that is so far away. So every AR device that is like high uh, per performance or high experience will still be a VR device. So pushing MR, more consumers adopting MR means the VR stuff will also be pushed as well as a side effect. And that's great. And just again, a comparison of all the uh, stereoscopic mixed reality headsets we might see with the next year. Um, the Quest Pro, again, uh, is predicted to be around $1,500 for a full kit. Prosumer, uh, enterprise, uh, working, productivity focus. And then Apple's uh, has been rumored much more as well to have an Apple, uh, they call it the Reality One or Reality Pro One or something like that. Um, and it's being said that it might cost more than $2,000. And then there's the Lynx R1, which is closer to what a Stinson model would be. It's from a startup company, and they're doing a lot of neat things with mixed reality. They've been believing this for longer and kind of been kickstarting the uh, the sort of like open platform version of a mixed reality headset. And they kickstarted for $600. And if Stinson starts at $400, uh, again, if there's a lot of hype between these larger devices, these high-end devices, especially when Apple gets in the ring, shows off the software capabilities of what mixed reality can do, Meta releasing a device like this for around $400 price point that can do a lot of those features at an uh, affordable cost would probably do well, in my opinion. Now, we're going to talk about some of the design decisions, uh, mostly related to the, uh, and what did I write here, the, the what strap? Oh, yeah, the soft strap, right. Uh, that was kind of the biggest complaint people had. And of course, this is because the leak came right after uh, the Pico 4 was announced and showed off. Uh, and there's a lot of hype for the Pico device. And that's well deserved. I think they did a great job with the design of that device. And people are very excited for it. And uh, the ravings of the comfort and the, the balance and everything has been just so fantastic. But I do want to kind of compare why I think Meta might be going this route and why from an objective standpoint, it might be a good idea from a business standpoint, but also people who uh, like to have more control over their hardware and like to sort of modify it or upgrade it. So yeah, obviously the soft strap on the Quest 2, I, I took it off um, for reasons, is terrible. <laughs> it's honestly the most uncomfortable thing, but obviously it uh, adds to being uh, a cheap device or adds to being making it be able to be a cheap device, even though the, if you lose your soft strap and you want to buy another one, it's 30 US dollars uh, to, to buy an, another replacement soft strap, which is hilariously expensive. Um, but another concern people had other than the actual strap is they were worried about them putting the ports in the actual uh, the, the, the sides here because they were like, that seems like it would be very prone to failure. Well, I was I'll take a very deep look into those ports and it looks like those ports themselves wouldn't actually uh, move. But the things would rotate, the actual strap uh, would rotate around it. And even with the Quest 2, as you can see here when I'm rotating, it doesn't even rotate that much. So again, I really don't think 
the, the, the positioning will be an issue in terms of breaking or anything like that. They also kind of use that the current Quest 2 strap. This is a teardown from uh, iFixit where they show the actual speaker drivers is pretty much uh, embedded within the actual strap currently right now. So I don't, I, again, I don't think that's a big issue if you want to look at it from an objective standpoint. But I think the main reason why they want to go with the soft strap is because the actual amount of margins and money they can make off of the actual accessories to upgrade the soft strap to something more comfortable has been a huge money maker for Meta. Uh, perhaps even a bigger money maker in some ways than the software libraries where they take a cut from developers. Uh, that's speculation, but they are taking extreme margins on the hardware. Um, they're selling the Elite Strap for battery right now for 120 US dollars. And I guarantee that thing costs very little to mass produce. And um, yeah, I, I think they wanted to also continue this. Um, but there's some benefits to putting the ports in the side as well. Whereas maybe they can design straps with these wires embedded directly into the thing that would snap to the side uh, to remove any ugly looking excess wires to make things look more like what a uh, a least track without battery would look like, even though it might have audio features or, or battery features built in. I also said in my last video that uh, the, the headset would be compatible with the Quest Pro dock. Um, I it, it does have charging contacts for sure, but the charging contacts are actually different than uh, or at least the layout is different than the Quest Pro's charging dock uh, contacts. So probably not the same dock as the Quest Pro, but will be compatible with dark charging. Um, I do stand by that. You can see that it's literally the same sort of method of charging. And it, actually, the, the one thing uh, I should have noted is the Stinson charging uh, contacts look very similar to the charging contacts on the Quest Pro controllers more than anything. So yeah, I do think they want to support the idea of an ecosystem of accessories that third parties or first parties can make to just make the whole uh, uh just make money on accessories i mean look how much money uh so the things on the left here are actually licensed uh meta accessories meta quest 2 accessories and you can see they're, they're sold for a pretty good amount and uh licensing is something i think meta has been pushing heavily especially recently i keep hearing all these uh these rumors and like other new uh made for meta they call it made for meta products which are basically seems to be very similar to the made for iPhone or made for iPod type of licensing system that Apple has been making also a ton of money on for many, many years. I think Meta is trying to build up their own. Um, obviously, the benefits of being on this licensing platform is uh, if there's any brick and mortar stores with Quest 2 sections or even on the Quest 2 website, they will sell these uh, products alongside as sort of a you can trust this. Uh, we give our brand uh, approval on this. Um, the most recent one that came to the public was the VR AirBridge from D-Link. It actually just showed its price today, and I was correct, and that it is going to be US only at first as a beta. But that product is 99 US dollars, and there's a non-meta uh, branded version of this sort of Wi-Fi uh, dongle on Amazon for $60. And I know this has like custom firmware and stuff, but really you can see they're taking some pretty big margins as well for even licensed accessories. And I expect this to, I expect them to partner with even more companies when it comes to straps and docks and things for future products. I, again, it's a huge money maker for them and they are looking for every profit revenue they can um, in their Reality Labs uh, sector. Now, this was the thing that unfortunately confused the most people and it's really frustrating um hopefully when i mean a lot of these chips are not even officially announced and maybe that's part of it but as well i want to mention that uh qualcomm has been preparing to rebrand all their chips they've actually already done it for all their smartphone lines where they're adding the word generation to all their products like for example uh their their, their mobile uh phone chip set is called the snapdragon 8 gen 1 or something like that um, and they are bringing that naming platform to the XR chips, including the XR1 and XR2. And I said in my last video that uh, it is going to be using a XR2 Gen 2 chip. And we've been talking about how Quest Pro will be using an XR2 revised chip. I want to get in more detail to explain that this XR2 Gen 2 completely different uh, than what we've been using for the Quest 2 and the Quest Pro. 
So just as a recap of everything I've heard so far, the Quest 2 uses a uh, version of the XR2, the original version, that is called the SXR2130P. And that was based on the Snapdragon 865 mobile processor with some changes and a lot of things to add for um, camera bandwidth and stuff, but basically make it a VR ready chip. And I've been told many times that the Quest Pro, and I made some videos about this, is they're using a revised version of that chip where they're separating the RAM and from the actual SOC package um, to actually get better cooling. Um, and while the Quest 2 XR2 is underclocked, um, if it wasn't overclocked, this XR, SXR 2150P, which is a revised version of the Gen 1 XR2, I've been told will give you 30% more performance over the non-underclocked version. But when we get into the Quest 3 territory, you'll notice with these numbering schemes that they actually have the second number change instead of the third number. So this third number, if this third number changes, that means it's a revision. If this second number changes, that means it's an actual generation of a chip. And the SXR 2230P, which is known as Project Halliday, will be a brand new chip based on a new node. And uh, I actually have been hearing a lot of people uh, start talking to me about what that chip uh, this thing is going to be based on is. And I can tell you, it'll be a lot more powerful than the 865 that uh, the current XR2 is built on. It actually impressed me when I heard um, what chip it is, but I can't talk about it yet. I'm still finalizing all my sources and, and, and making sure that this information is correct. So uh, once I get that finalized, I will probably make a video or tweet or announcements related to exactly what you can expect for the XR2 Gen 2 and what chip it's based on. But again, I was very impressed about the, the sort of power that this next generation chip will have. And even though it will have a lot of power, of course, the uh, Quest 3 does seem to be going with a single fan design. So it may be underclocked or maybe not, depending on how much uh, they've nailed down the cooling situations. Um, I noticed the Pico 4 has said they're not underclocked and they're using a single fan design, so I don't know. But uh, I still think the gains, and the, especially the GPU gains for this new chip in the Quest 3, will excite the standalone only gamers, um, even though I still think developers are going to still focus on the XR2 Gen 1 uh, at a baseline for what they want to port their products to rather than uh, just focus on this uh, new chip right away. But still, it will trickle down and there will be more performance headroom for developers to have higher uh, fidelity standalone ARM experiences. Final reminder on roadmap, by the way, uh, this was a leaked roadmap uh, that there were multiple headsets other than Quest Pro. So Quest Pro this year is called Arcata, um, which obviously is it's 2022, uh, a prosumer version of the Quest. And uh, an elite roadmap, there was the Stinson, which is I've been talking about in this video, my last video. It is a consumer facing quest that is slated for 2023 right now. But there was also another consumer quest that was slated for 2024. We don't know yet uh, what that quest has or what features it has working on it. Um, but that one was called Cardiff. Um, so even if there's some features that you feel should be in a consumer quest, which is supposed to be ch much cheaper than the Quest Pro, we'll have all the features of the Quest Pro. Um, there may be another version of a consumer quest, maybe a Quest Plus, that's speculation or something um, in 2024. And then a sort of Cambria 2.0 or a Quest Pro 2 uh, is also slated for 2024. And that is codenamed Funston. I've heard almost nothing about that, but I'm highly speculating that will be the device that will be the micro OLED version of the Quest uh, first, because a lot of things in the supply chain are kind of lining up to that being the case. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens when we get closer to some newer leaks related to these other products. This was the final thing I wanted to leave all of you off on. Um, so late last year, uh, this was a there was a market research going out to people in different areas. And uh, I wanted to re bring it up because all these features in this uh, this market research and the pictures are obviously not the same as the Stinson device we see here. But the controllers are interesting. I think the controllers what made people feel that this was a meta product because it looks just like the Quest Pro controllers, except white and very simplified. Um, but all these things here mentioned that they were looking into seeing whether people would afford a cheaper version without controllers that has high fidelity hand tracking. And in both of these, even the, the model with controllers, they don't mention anything about eye or face tracking built in, but they do mention uh, like AAA experiences, uh, 
and newly redi redesigned lenses and the latest processor. And most importantly, they talked about a focus on mixing your real world with the virtual world. So it wouldn't surprise me that uh, late last year is when they were kind of deciding whether to go forward with this mixed reality concept and using market research stuff to decide. Um, these prices here were before that uh, the recession kind of started getting harder and before the Quest uh, 2 was raised to $400. So I wouldn't expect these prices at this point uh, for next year. But still, I just wanted to bring it up because it just kind of lines up with all this entire Stinson Lake. And that might be complete coincidence, but I don't, I don't think so, though. So. Anyway, that is everything I had to say about this video or this follow up video. If you have any more questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section or or even just save them for uh, the Meta Connect stream. I will be streaming it next Tuesday from this video that I release it, which is literally seven days from now. So we can do a uh, sort of pre show and I can clear up anything that you still might be confused about uh, based on what I'm hearing and about, about this device or maybe Quest Pro. Um, it is a fun time to be a VR fan and yeah, uh, special thanks to all my patrons. These are my mega patrons I'm showing off right here. Um, they give me $25 a month and it allows me to keep doing this. I'm very thankful. Um, if you want to support me, go to bradsmells.com slash Patreon so I can continue talking about VR in the most boring way possible. Yeah, these people are crazy. All right, bye.